my name is Palma Accardi, and you are watching Title Flooding Talk, which is brought to you by the New Jersey Coastal Coalition, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Tonight's guest is Commissioner John Amadeo, who has experience in construction, engineering, and city government. Hi, John. How are you tonight? I'm doing good, Palma. Thank you for inviting me uh, to be a part of your show tonight. And John, nice to have you here, Commissioner. Um, I'm Dan Skelton, meteorologist with the New Jersey Coastal Coalition and every other outlet, newspaper, radio, TV in South Jersey. And really, really happy to be signed on with the Coastal Coalition. Really happy to pre uh, present to you a title flooding talk each and every Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. You can come on down to the Irish Pub in Atlantic City. They they proudly sponsor this. Great food, great drink. We're working on some uh, some great title flooding talk food and drink specials as well, so hopefully more details on that to come. And of course, if you can't come down here live, I mean, it's nice weather, you may want to, uh, you know, be out enjoying that, you can always watch us live on Facebook and join the conversation, ask questions, uh, this is live and intera interactive, or you can just be a listener. We talk tidal flooding on the issues of increasing awareness, education, and resiliency along the shore. You know, Margate, right smack dab in the middle of Obsecan Island, so you guys deal with it, so let's get the conversation started. So, John, could you tell us a little more about your background and how coastal flooding has influenced your life as both a lifelong resident and in your career? Well, Palma, as you said, I'm a lifelong resident of a barrier island, and tidal flooding and coastal flooding is all a part of it. I've lived through many events in the 68 years I've been uh, a resident in Margate. Um, what, what I can tell you the most is that we as a community have been very proactive. And I should start off by saying, uh, during my time in the General Assembly, uh, I was in the Assembly at the time Superstorm Sandy hit uh, the state of New Jersey, uh, Cape May to Sandy Hook. Uh, shortly after the storm, we did a tour of the entire assembly uh, caucus, did a, a tour of the whole state of New Jersey to see the damage. And although we witnessed a lot of issues on the southern part of the state, if you traveled to Manasquan, Point Pleasant, the northern parts of the state, you could really see the devastation. So there, there is no telling, and Dan is being the expert, you, you, you can target where it's going to hit, you never know exactly where it's going to hit, and when it hits, you better be prepared. And that's something that we have to live with every day, living on barrier islands, and we have to be prepared. So all this awareness and all this talk is instrumental in helping our residents understand the dangers that are associated with it, the dangers that we're faced with, and what we have to do to prepare ourselves. Um, let me ask a follow-up question to that because, I mean, you're a lifelong Margate resident. Margate was, was hit hard yes. during Sandy, one of the worst storms of our generation. Yes. But it actually, in, in, you know, in no um, disrespect to the damage done in Margate and along the South Jersey shore, it pales in comparison to what you saw up in North Jersey. So, so how do you prepare residents for... You know, who, who didn't see the North Jersey destruction firsthand saying, hey, you know, we could be ground zero one day. Exactly. You know, how do you prepare residents for, hey, it could get even worse than this? Well, we, we have to prepare every day as we move forward. And when I say prepare, a lot of things have been done. There's been a lot of grants from the federal government have come forward to help homeowners that are in low-lying areas raise their houses. That's a critical situation that you should address that if you're in low-lying areas to bring your, your your structure up to base flood elevation according to FEMA regulations to protect your personal items but the most important thing I'll say is you have to heed instructions and when uh, FEMA and when uh, emergency response tells you emergency management tells you to evacuate you should take it serious because they're prepared they see it they're listening to meteorologists like yourself studying it, which is a science. And, and in your profession, you learned how to really nail down things. And very few times you've been wrong 
and other I'll, media. I, I think that's generous, but thank you. I'll take the very few. No, very few. <laughs> well, thank you. But and, and as you target things, you know when it's going to come and hit. So people have to take it seriously and have to understand the ramifications if they don't follow directions. And again, preparedness is the most important part. Preventativeness is what we're doing now. Communities have all gotten together. They're working. The Coastal Coalition has, has created this multi-jurisdictional coalition. It has really spread, you know, it, it, it's really a good concept where everybody's on the same page as we move forward. The thing I look at so importantly in Margate, where we're very fortunate, with the FEMA grants and the raising the houses and the demolition and the new construction, and Pama can speak to this because she runs our building department, we've been 70 new building permits a year for yeah, new last houses. Yeah, 2017. Even 16. Yes, yeah, and in 16 there was 70. So all these new structures are coming up to elevation. But then again, you might be safe for, for flooding, but there's no telling what's going to happen with any storm that comes in. Tornadoes, twisters, we've witnessed those. I've witnessed one re recently landing in Fort Lauderdale. We were diverted to Miami three weeks ago and uh, our plane was uh, in a critical situation landing into Fort Lauderdale. Couldn't land as the twister hit and destroyed part of the airport and we finally landed in Miami. Well, thankfully so, that's one of the few things we don't get, get too here, often yeah, here, you know, we, we, and those derechos as well. But the but the nor'easters and the coastal storms and the hurricanes and the tropical systems, you know, all are I think the biggest just year-round threat along the Jersey Shore. I want to say hi, uh, Robert Sherman. Nice to have you uh, checking in. Robert actually came down live last week, watched it uh, from the bar, and uh, is viewing on Facebook today. Justin Thomas, Leon Benson, all joining in. Uh, Kristen Kaiser. Hi to Dan and Palmer, Carol Bakley as well, Lori Cedeno. Yeah, beautiful day in EHT. No tidal flooding today, no tidal flooding this week, but you know, it, it is it is a quiet time of the year for it. May and June doesn't happen all that often, but it's a year round threat. And we're a year round show every Tuesday, at 7 p.m. But what happens in August? Well, the storm season. A hurricane season <laughs> actually begins June 1st. True. Uh, well, but you're right, it peaks in August and September. So as the Commissioner of Public Safety in Margate, what are some of the things that you immediately do to prepare when a coastal storm is on its way? Well, I have to give credit to our both our police department and our fire department, which have implemented programs way before I became involved. And they sort of have it down to a science as to what they exactly do, the roads we block. We know where the flooding issues are in Margate. We try to keep the cars and the residents out of those areas. We put barriers. We have five of those high, what we call high wheel military vehicles that are monster trucks that we park on the streets, block pedestrians, and block vehicle or traffic from entering those areas. And, and, and again, uh, our emergency management team, we get together at the police department. We, we study the tides, they're monitoring it all the time, and what we do is we try to, the, our vulnerable residents, they know if they call 911, they're going to get rescued. We've had many occasions where we've had situations like that, but, you know, again, we have our shelter set up, which is uh, our municipal building, 9001 Winchester Avenue, and when people are in trouble we have access to move them to those to that shelter and and you know house them do what we have to do I think one of the things we're talking off camera about you know minor flooding moderate flooding major flooding people always want to know if their streets gonna flood um, you know and what does major flooding mean to me what does moderate flooding mean to me and one of the one of the projects that is, is in the works for Margate and every coastal community and with the help of technology and and basically, you know, uh, GIS mapping is is a, basically a product that I want you to talk a little more about that's basically going to, you know, help coastal residents know, all right, is my street going to flood? Right. And, and and Dan brings up a good point. As as we're moving forward, the federal government is getting involved and the state, and go state government's involved where they're mandating that all municipalities 
uh, partake and set themselves up with a GSI mapping system which lays out all the grades throughout the municipality, city, or township. It also is going to, in our situation, we're going to have all our infrastructure, our storm sewer, our sewer, and our water system, and even our gas system will all be mapped out in this GIS system that we'll have CDs of that we can plug into the computer and if there's not only flooding or, or we're going to know that an approaching storm is, we can look at the vulnerable areas. We're also going to be moving forward where we need to make repairs. We're going to know what's in the street, when it was put in the street, and to know what other repairs we have, you know, what other new construction we have to do at the time. So again, that's the federal government and the state government working together to improve and, and, and create safety for our, for our people. Yeah. And actually, the New Jersey Coastal Coalition also working on something as well, where we're basically, you know, it's it's in development, as they say. That's a technical, you know, industry term. But some big advancements recently, and um, on that, where you know, every coastal town is going to basically have a map saying, "All right, minors floods here, moderate floods here." Right. And basically, you can just pull something out and say, "Okay, my street's going to flood or not?" Because if you watch newscasts or weathercasts now, you know. Sometimes it's tough to determine. All right, is exactly my street Exactly where? Fly? Yes. Right. Exactly. So, so technology is helping out. It's nice to see governments working yeah. together and helping out, and of course, New Jersey Coastal Coalition um, doing it free of charge for you. I mean, it's uh, it's it's one of the things we want to do is increase awareness and the understanding and and, and resiliency and living with tidal flooding, which is becoming you know an increasing an way of life along the uh, along the Jersey. We're not shore. going to get away from it. That's right. <laughs> Now, Margate is considered a um, Class 5 community in the CRS program, which saves homeowners 25% on their flood insurance every year. Could you tell us more about this? Well, the CR community rating system is a system in which, as you progress and elevate houses, you add to the rating. And it's, it, it's, it's a lot of bureaucratic paperwork and we go through it every year and in fact we have hired a consultant uh, a, a gentleman that helps us get through the the paperwork side of the CRS and we you know submit it to FEMA uh, for their approval and Palma mentioned it right now the city of Margate is a has a rating of five and it translates across our municipality 2600 homes that every homeowner receives a 25% reduction in their flood insurance. So, you know, naturally houses that are built at a base flood elevation uh, of 11, you know, get a reduced rate because they've already reached that. But it also helps the people that have mortgages and are forced because of their mortgage to have flood insurance, they're also receiving that 25% rate ink decrease so it's a benefit to the whole community and mark our building department i gotta give accolades to where it, it, the work comes from our building department our staff there palma being our department you know in charge of the, uh, the yeah. you know the uh, office of the building department every everything we do we try to achieve marks with the community rating system and that helps everybody across the board so it's it's really a great program and we work hard at it, it, it there's no question about it the, again the coastal coalition has been very heavily involved with it uh, they're supportive uh, their meetings monthly uh, they discuss it their outreach is educating our residents reg educating other communities and they're, it's spreading so it, it's 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 great work for the people that have have started this whole process well, let me ask a uh, it, it won't be a controversial question but it will be a on a controversial topic of course, Margate was in the news with the dunes which we're not going to talk about <laughs> we can right? talk about uh, uh, because uh, you know that's a, that's a whole separate issue however you guys are right you know I mean um, re regardless of how the dunes case played out you know tidal flooding more often than not comes from the bay sure. so what is margate doing and what can margate continue to do in other coastal communities for that matter to to combat the flooding along the bay i mean you guys have the great system of bulkheads great um, question right so, great so question. I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer away because i'm sure it's it's a popular topic uh, it, it in is margate, it, so. it, it is and 
you hit the nail on the head that our majority of flooding comes from the bay. But let's understand one thing. A bulkhead is a protective structure. It doesn't prevent water from coming through. So you're still, with a bulkhead, you're, you're protecting the structure upland of the bay. But water, we've raised the elevation by ordinance. We created a new, our, our bulkheads are all at elevation nine on the bay. That's to prevent the velocity and the wind from pushing masses of water over. But you're still gonna get, at high tides, water infiltrating a bulkhead, but it's gonna protect the land. It's gonna calm it down. So, in essence, dunes are a protective source. And I agree that we have a contiguous bulkhead system on our ocean front. What we witnessed during Sandy was a lot of sand over the bulkhead. Very little damage to our residential homes on our beachfront. I think Palma could tell you there was probably five building permits, seven building permits for actual damage pulled for actual damage for uh, oceanfront, beachfront homes. With that said, we have added protection now. Throughout the fight, we always never wanted dunes because we felt we had the protection there. But as we move forward and we see the purpose of the dune being a contiguous, contiguous structure from the tip of Atlantic City um, at the inlet to Longport, I think it's going to be a benefit in the future. For the people that didn't want dunes, it's equally people wanted dunes. You know, the vote when it went for referendum was a 65 margin vote. It won by 65 voters. So that tells you it's sort of a double-edged sword. There's equal people that wanted it and equal people that didn't want it. I've sat in meetings where we had elderly residents that lived not on the beach block, but lived between Atlantic and Ventnor Avenue that were so ecstatic and happy that now that they have dunes, they feel a, com a comfort level of protection. Right. So we have to look at the, the big picture. And the big picture was when it was presented to us, we always knew because of our drainage system from the center of Atlantic Avenue always drained towards the ocean. We had a, an archaic system where we dug out the scuppers, relieved the massive water that built on our street ends from Atlantic Avenue to the bulkhead, let the water out, pushed the sand back into the trench, and everybody was happy. There were residents that had owned houses for 30, 40 years that had to wear boots whenever it rained, when they walked out of their house because they had six, eight, ten inches of water in the street. Those issues will disappear with the design of the system that the uh, Army Corps designed. So the flooding will reside and we're going to live with outfalls, which upsets a lot of people, especially when you look at them, right. which I, I see them every day. No, I mean, down a, every, aesthetic is, is something of, I mean, you, you yeah. like to maintain a nice look yeah, at the we've, shore. You well, do. we've had it. Right. We've always had right. a, a great, clean, uh, uh, no, no mechanical structures on our beach, and now we're going to have to live with five mechanical structures. And it's, it's a fact of life. It was court mandated, and that's how it, it ended up. So that's talking about the dunes a little bit, Dan. And I appreciate yeah. that. And, and, and and you know, regardless of the battle, I mean, you, I mean, Margate has the same, and, and the and the and the residents and, and the representatives of Margate have the same goal as every single coastal town: is to protect the town, do in the best interest of your town, uh, prevent tidal flooding, or at least do whatever you can to limit tidal flooding exactly. and make life more, you know enjoyable and less disruptive for your residents. So, I mean, you guys you guys definitely care about, you know, your town, which is great. And, I mean, I know a lot of debate went into this, but, but, but it, it's it's all good debate because I, because I think you come out ahead at the end. So, thank you for your reference. Now, I do want to say, if you're watching live on Facebook, you can send in your questions. I want to make sure we're checking our questions. Did anyone ask? Yeah, me? Joe actually wanted to... Uh, uh, ask about the dune situation oh. in Margate. So asked and answered very well by uh, Commissioner Amadeo. And, um, uh, you know, it's actually, it's it's tough because, you know, May and June's kind of a quiet time of the year for tidal flooding. We're not getting nor'easters anymore, more often than not. We had a really bad Mother's Day storm back in May of like 2007 or eight. So nor'easters can happen in May, but they kind of freak things. So May and June's kind of a quiet time for tidal flooding. But, you know, I, I think, 
there's never a quiet time to talk about it. So we're using this quiet weather to uh, to uh, to raise awareness. But the prevailing winds in May and June are southeast. Yes. Which you know, the change of seasons move the sand in different directions. That's right. So we should start with the four northeasters we had in the month of March yep. that pushed a lot of sand away. That had a major concern for a lot of our residents that more of the pipe of the the one completed outfall was exposed now should diminish as the sand comes back correct it should theoretically okay. according to science according to science, army corps yes. science that, that should theoretically work you never know there's a wild card here or there but it, but in theory that's exactly if what it doesn't happen. i'm yes. sure the army corps is in a lot of trouble <laughs> <laughs> now i do um want to ask, do you think outreach is one of the greater challenges when it comes to getting this information out there for your residents? Well, well I, I believe outreach is, is a key component, and I think residents really will abide by the outreach and listen. And, you know, every home should have a preparedness program. I mean, the way I, the way I do it personally, I know that you have to be prepared for any storm. If you lose power, you should have a backpack with a first aid kit. You should have batteries. You should have additional flashlights. You should have candles. You should have lighters. You should have all the things necessary to be able to survive over a, a few days period. So I think uh, the awareness and I think just the people that lived through and visually saw the graphics on TV of the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy understand the severity and don't take anything for granted if it's if it's if it's being told on national tv to pack your bags and get off of a barrier island you better follow through is there a i mean because i ask every guest this because meteorologists and public safety we have the same goal of if we say mandatory evacuation in theory we want and here's the theory thing again we want 100% of people gone, no one on the islands except first responders and the people that have to be there. Exactly. We know that that's never, ever going to happen. I mean, even after Sandy, uh, you know, you might have some people who had to call 911 that they're going to leave, but there, there are still some people that, you know what, no matter what, I'm staying with my home. You know, and, and I'll ask you, is there anything we can do, uh, you know, as an outreach through tidal flooding talk, through public safety, through meteorology and media, is there anything we can do to, to get that rate up? Because it's frustrating because it you have days and days warning. Uh, I mean, you know what could happen if the worst case scenario pans out, and people are putting themselves and first responders in harm way, harm's way. So, so is there anything that you would suggest that that we can do? I would, ha as you were saying that, I was thinking of one thing that I know we didn't do in Margie, but I know it was done elsewhere, which is a good possibility, is that you set up busing and you have designated areas because you always have a decent timeline. You know with what you're reporting when we need to be out of right. there. And to relieve the traffic, if you have buses set up and you, you, you have a, a, a central place for your seniors, the ones I worry about are our seniors. Uh, we're going to go. Right. I'm not going to stay there. I'm going to get a hotel room in Philly and, and you know live through the storm. But the bottom line is, is we've got to protect our seniors and our vulnerable residents, and we have to set up a situation so that we can get them off, because some have no family, some have no way of even driving and getting off the island. So that's something, you know, that we'll look forward to in the future, in the event that we have a major or a catastrophic storm coming, we'll look in that direction. Justin Thomas, there's always a couple um, clever comments each week, right? Uh, Justin Thomas says, at least Lucy the Elephant is elevated, so she's fine in storms. <laughs> uh, well, you know, we worry about Lucy because uh, Lucy's very important to the city of Margate, and we cherish Lucy. Uh, and it's one thing I, I witnessed when they moved it, and I witnessed when Arthur Henry did all the work on its sheet metal back in the 70s. Um, she's still vulnerable, and we have to be very careful, and we, we have to take care of her. Right. We can't lose her. Right. And, and, and every structure, of course, in Margate, right, we, we want to take care of, we want to limit the flooding, we want to increase awareness, and like I said, that's what we're doing every Tuesday, 7 p.m., Irish Pub, Tidal Flooding Talk. Um, you can come on down. You can watch us live on Facebook. 
Uh, we'll let Palma ask any last second questions as I peruse Facebook. Did we, did we get through everything? I think we did. Um, I want to tell everyone to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and soon to be Twitter. Um, and a special thank you to our guest, Commissioner John Amadeo. And to say our thank you, we have an Irish pub t shirt from the Irish pub and the coalition. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And is there any last second uh, you know, tidbits that we didn't discuss that you wanted to chat about? No, I think we really covered uh, a lot of uh, good information. Uh, again, you're a wealth of knowledge, Dan. Uh, I've always admired Dan. Uh, I've watched you when I went to the Galloway Parade, when you did your stand there. Remember, yep. remember the years Every year. That? Yeah, every and, year I've done and that. And we yeah. miss you. We need TV 40 back. <laughs> as I told Dan when I was walking in the door, we need it back. TV 40 was five nights a week. Uh, well, I did five nights a week. <laughs> Tidal Flooding Talk, though, still on. We're here. Uh, uh, one night a week. Maybe we'll expand that. Actually, we do have some pretty cool stuff coming up in the summer. Uh, I'm going to take you to some lighthouses, you know, East Point Lighthouses, dealing with, uh, you know, some issues, you know, as the bay comes up on that. We're going to take you to some places where nature has reclaimed. So, uh, in addition to every Tuesday, at the Irish pub. Now, I always put Palm on the spot because, again, she's the prepared one. I'm the just fly off the cuff guy uh, and the ad lib guy. Um, our yes. guest next week. Uh, our guest next week. I do know the guest for next week, and it's Jay Dilworth. He is the owner of a third party inspection agency for building inspections, and he just won Building Inspector of the Year at the May conference. See how prepared she is? <laughs> It's great. It's great. He's the prepared one, and uh, Jay will be a great guest. Yeah. Yeah, Jay and, worked for John for some time, too. And, and we have some great guests lined up throughout the spring and summer. So, again, you can come on down here, have some food and drink with us afterwards, uh, ask questions live afterwards, and some great conversation. We talk title flooding, but we talk other stuff, too, after the show <laughs> is done. So uh, we'll hopefully see you next Tuesday night. Thanks for being here, Commissioner. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, John. Thank you, Palmer. See you back here soon.